With no further ado, welcome back Matt Johnson, Director of Operation Avalanche. So we, we did ourselves some, some talking while the movie was on. We talked Human Giant, Arrested Development. Uh, oh yeah, all briefly. great references for this film. Exactly. We touched briefly upon Magic Mike, which might be appropriate because there might be a lot of lawbreakers in this crowd tonight. Ah. Ah. Because you, you promised to tell them how to break laws. Well, I said that we, were, we wanted to make a movie that seemed so ambitious that people would tell us it was impossible to make. And in order to do that, we had to break a, lo a lot of laws. But they were like the type of things where I think as film students, you think what you're doing is illegal, and then you find out later that a lawyer can find some very tricky ways to make it seem like what you did was legal. Do you want some examples is of that, that? Is that? Is that expensive? And yes, yeah. give us specific examples sure. of this, please. Okay. First of all, thank you guys so much for coming to see this movie. It means so much to me. Isn't it so great to be Canadian? <laughs> Oh, I love Canada so much. You have no idea. I was away from Canada for a long time. It's my first day back in like 30 days. It's, I'm serious. It's hell out there. Um, <laughs> it's so nice being back. Um, okay, so a lot of the stuff that you saw, we shot without permits or releases. Um, every, every single person in this movie who's not me, Owen, or Josh is a real person who doesn't know they're on camera. Um, or knows they're on camera but thinks they're in a documentary about the 1960s that has nothing to do with faking the moon landing. And we had to do that because obviously we wanted to shoot at real NASA because we thought, oh, this movie. Also, I don't believe the moon landing was faked. I find myself, I always need to make sure I say that. None get of us do. Get it out early. Yeah, that's, yeah. An, insane, that's an insane belief. <laughs> We, I just thought the story was really cool, and I thought the idea of the person who, who, who would try to fake the moon landing was interesting. And more, we were trying to just tell a really crazy story about ambition and what ambition will lead you to do. But what ambition led us to do was tell NASA that we were film students in Canada, which was true, um, and that we were making a documentary about the Apollo program in the 1960s. And NASA is in a very interesting place politically because they're not allowed to advertise themselves. Um, we, we don't have a, a major Canadian space program in the same way, um, but, but uh, so we, uh, we don't have as much contact with the Canadian space program, but in America, NASA is like dying for funding. They are, are super underfunded. People are like, departments are closing all the time. And so they are so open to having people from the media or filmmakers or writers or artists come in and just film anything because it's just good for them to get their name out there. And so they were like, oh yeah, sure, come on down, Canadians, that sounds great. And when we were there, we showed up with like our 16 millimeter cameras dressed like we were in the 1960s and they didn't say a thing. They were like, all right, yeah, come on in. So what do you guys want to see? And we were like, ah, uh, because we, this is the first thing we shot for the movie, I should say. We didn't shoot anything because we didn't know if we were going to get it. And so we got there and literally this movie was made without a script. Um, but we got there like, so what do you want to see? And we're like, um, is the place where they controlled the moon launch still here? <laughs> and they were like, oh sure, yeah, we left it exactly the same. We were like, oh, cool, would you leave us in here for maybe 10, 20 minutes? <laughs> and they did, and I'm not, and it's, it may seem like I'm exaggerating, but that's just because even now to me, it's so crazy that that happened. That scene where I'm like, we're gonna fake the moon landing, come on, Owen, this is gonna be so great. And Owen's like, oh, this is crazy. Like, we had no idea what we were doing. We were in this room, and we were like, oh, we have to ha make a scene right now where Matt pitches Owen the plan to fake the moon landing. And, and, and we were like, all right, we had 10 minutes to do it, and we did it. And during the entire scene, there's a tour group of about 150 American students behind uh, glass because they've got a viewing area right where you can't see. And it's soundproof, so we couldn't hear them and they couldn't hear us. But to them, it looked like some kind of old-timey recreation or something, I guess. <laughs> And for us, we were like, oh shit, we just got to get through this as fast as possible. And if you watch, if you look at that scene, again, you'll see like their, their, their cameras are flashing. They're taking pictures of us. They're like, oh, this is so neat. NASA set up a little old-timey play <laughs> for us. A little us. diorama for a di us. That's what yeah. it looked like. If only they could hear us. We're like, we're going to fake the moon landing. Oh, it's going to be great. So anyway, so, what, but w before we went and did this, our lawyer... Did anybody see, there's a 2013 film called Escape from Tomorrow. 
It's a, it's sort of a horror film all shot at Disneyland. And they shot that completely without permission. And when I had made The Dirties, I went to many film festivals with the director of that film and I asked him how they were able to legally get away with that. And he introduced me to their lawyer, a guy named Chris Perez, who made this crazy <laughs> argument for fair use that, that they could, as long as they had the footage, they owned it and they could do what they wanted with it. And so we called that same guy and said, hey, could we do the same thing at NASA? And he was like, you got it. <laughs> and that is basically, in a nutshell, the story of how this movie was made. Because without that, there's no way we could have made this film. Uh, just because we didn't, we didn't have the money, there's no way we were going to rebuild Mission Control or even rebuilding the hallways at NASA. A and the access that we had, like the people we spoke to, the guy who tells me there's places on Earth that look like the moon, all that kind of stuff. It's the type of stuff that you just can't fake or write. Um, and in order for this to feel like a documentary, in as much as it does, uh, we needed some real people to be in it. And so, yeah, if it weren't for that, if it weren't for that chance meeting with that director and then working with his lawyer, th there's no way that this movie would be, uh, would have ever been made. Yeah. The, uh, the Dirties is a much more aesthetically raw film than this. Um, I think for the obvious reasons that it's supposed to be shot by high school students. Um, this marks like a, a vast leap forward kind of aesthetically and I think in terms of like filmmaking assurance. Um, was that just the fact that you got away with the dirties that allowed you to kind of operate with that sort of confidence or what were some of those key steps for you to get from that to this film? Well, I mean, I think it depends who you ask. I'm sure there's people who have seen both movies that would say this movie's a lot uglier than the dirties. Um, I mean, we shot on, this is, a, this is a 16 millimeter print. We didn't screen it on 16, but this is a 16 millimeter print that was positive to like 1952 ectochrome, like destroyed film basically. Like the, the way we got it to look like this was, like the, the actual quality of this image is basically garbage. But that shooting the dirties that way was more of us trying to match our, our situation being like broke neophyte filmmakers with the f formal language of, of, of the film. So like we were trying to match the two. I think this also feels like you're watching people who don't really know how to make a documentary really trying to put it together. But the inspiration for this was very different than the dirties. Like this, these guys are sort of inspired by like Maisel's Brothers documentaries or Alan King documentaries. Really that Haskell Wexler movie Medium Cool where they were shooting everything shoulder mounted with BL cameras was what we tried to get it all to look like. And we used the same cameras and this, more importantly the same lenses. We used ingenue zoom lenses um, that were very, very slow on, on our cameras. And that's why like, things are so out of focus. Everything looks so weird and creamy and, and, um, and why the zooms aren't nearly as fast as they were in the Dirties or in Nirvana, the band, the show. Where normally, I mean, this is, much, this is not nearly as funny, in my opinion, as the, those other things that we did. And I think a lot of it is because the speed with which you can move these cameras and, and that you can zoom and find focus is like a tenth of what, of what you could with, uh, with those other things, with digital technology. Uh, do we have any questions out here? Mm. Right in the middle? It's tough to see. I can't see you guys at all, just so you know. And yet they want us to stand here so they can see us. Yeah. I was told by the photographers, stand here. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, in the middle? Uh, first of all, big fan of the uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good for picking that up. We're, yeah, we try to put that in everything we do. Great. Thank you. Uh, and I was supposed to repeat the question. So how much planning went into the car chase? Um, less than you'd think, and that's because, uh, again, we had no money. And I think when you, when you see a car chase in normal movies, um, it, it, months and months of work go into making it safe. I think that's why, why a lot of action sequences are so difficult to do, because you know, they're trying to make sure that the lead actor doesn't die. Uh, we didn't really have those concerns. <laughs> <laughs> And so we just shot it on the last day of production, and, and <laughs> this is not a joke. This is what you have to do if you're a broke film student, man. It's not funny. <laughs> it's not. He could have died. Well, sure, but we d with that movie was in the can, although not really. Not really. We reshot this movie for about three months. Um, so so we, we planned it in as much as we wanted it to feel, like we planned the, like the aesthetic choices, like we knew that we wanted it to be from the perspective of Andy's camera in the back seat, we knew that we wanted it to feel like Andy wasn't ready to shoot at that moment, we knew we wanted it to be one take, 
And we knew that we wanted like the gun to blow out that one window because that's the only practical effect that happens in the whole in the whole thing. But otherwise, what you're watching is a largely improvised car chase where I don't really know what I'm doing. I just sort of know where the road is going to go. And the guy chasing me is a stunt driver, but I mean, he's it, he was surprised when we said, "Oh, we're just going to improvise." <laughs> 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 so. So, so the planning went into, like, we had, like, uh, you know, planning in, like, a story sense when you think, okay, I want this to happen and this to happen. We talked about it a lot. But in terms of, like, the mechanics of literally where the cars went, there was none. Because how could you really plan that? Like, I'm really just driving the car, and I'm trying to drive it as well as I can, but I'm not a talented driver. And the guy chasing me knows that he can, you know, crash into me in as much as, as, much as he did without killing me. Um, but... But uh, th things went really bad, like we crashed the car a bunch of times. The camera broke multiple times because Andy couldn't wear a seatbelt because in order for him to have like a full 360 range of motion with these cameras, which were gigantic, in the backseat of that car, he couldn't wear one. So whenever something went wrong, the camera would go flying, those doors wouldn't close. It was a nightmare, but we got it, which we're very proud of. <laughs> yeah, I'm very proud of that car chase scene just because when we first set out to do this movie, we, wa we wanted to do a fake documentary thing, the same type of stuff we did in the dirties, but on a bigger scale. And we thought, oh man, if we could do a really resonant car chase where the, we're getting away from the people chasing you could be felt in a different way. Like, it, we spent the whole movie setting up these documentary cameras and why these guys are shooting this as evidence for the CIA and like why the cameras would care about shooting the people and getting the identities of the people chasing us. Like, we just, we, we thought that if we could, this was a great way to sort of pay off a lot of the, like the formal hard work we put into, uh, into shooting the movie this way. And plus, I'd never seen a car chase done in a documentary, I mean, for obvious reasons, <laughs> right? Uh, so it just, it, it felt, it just felt like, uh, like we really had to figure out how to do it. You could do it yourselves, you film students. Get your friend to sit in the back seat and drive like crazy through Vancouver. <laughs> You will have what we did. I mean, that's basically what we did. I don't encourage that. You'll, yeah, I actually don't <laughs> well, encourage that. But you kind of do. Well, if yeah, you, do what you have to do to get your movies do. made, that's for sure. But I think, you know, the, the car chases receive, like, the most hallowed of comparisons, with, like, being compared to the French Connection, one of the great car chases of all time. And I think they what it is so is many the fact cuts. That, yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> but that's it. This is, like, someone who actually doesn't know how to drive a car at that sort of speed. And I think there is some sort of transference of that actual legitimate peril. If not, you know, someone put in a position they should not be put in. Right, doesn't know how to use a gun. Can't, like he gets his gun and he's like, I can't even do it. Like cause the, the whole idea, not the whole idea, but uh, an interesting idea in this film is that Matt is, tr much like the dirties, Matt is trying to turn himself into a movie character. Like, I mean, he's obsessed with like paranoid thrillers from that era. He just wants to be this guy so badly and he's molding his entire life. Like, He's having the people he works with film him saying, oh, we're going to use this later in case we get in trouble. But really, he's turning himself into a, the movie star he's obsessed with. And then when he's finally faced with all the things that a movie star has to do, namely kill the bad guys, get away, like save people, he can't do any of it. And, and I, I, like, I like it when you can put characters in that situation, giving them exactly what they've been in sort of um, egotistically saying, oh, yeah, I could do this or I want to do this. Uh, subconsciously or not, and then they get it, and they're like, oh, I actually can't do this, and this is hell. I don't want to drive like this. Well, it's kind of like the, uh, the counterweight to the audacity of the project itself, is like having to actually face the consequences of it, well, yeah. of the position you put yourself in. Yeah, I get it, yeah, of course, and then being like, oh, shit, I wish I was back in Langley, Virginia doing nothing. It would be a lot better. It's true. Uh, right about there. You know, <laughs> is there a motel somewhere with a hole still in the wall? You know what? That scene w was built by our production designer. That's the same motel room that I break through and break into. We just we just reversed it. There is, yeah. There's no. We tried that the first take with me breaking through the real wall. Got in a lot of trouble. Got thrown out of that motel. <laughs> Had to go to a new motel and build a fake wall. And uh, and I break through that, and then we hide a cut as the camera goes through, and then I come out the hole with Andy into the same hotel room. It's the same room, it's just mirrored. So no. <laughs> yes, uh, right there? Yeah, right there. 
Yeah, that lunar, the question was, what about that lunar lander? Did we build it? And yes, that was one of, the, one of the great gifts that NASA gave us is when we left, we said, hey, can we get the schematics of the lunar module? And they just gave us the blueprints for it. <laughs> True story. And then we were able to bring that to a construction team who just built it out of like wood, like cheap materials. But that's a one-to-one, -one, like one-to-one -one <laughs> replica of the lunar module. I think it's the only one in the world, but then I burned it. As one does. Yeah, as one does. Again, <laughs> NASA was so, I mean, again, I think NASA likes this movie. I mean, I know publicly they've said they hate it and fuck us for life, but, but, uh, but w we did a screening of this movie not too long ago uh, in Austin, Texas, and a lot of NASA staff were there, and they were dying. They thought it was crazy. So I think, I don't feel bad about what happened and what we had to do to get this movie made, including being like, can we have the schematics for this? Oh, and also every piece of 16 millimeter film you shot from 1960 to 1972, which we also got. You want to know something crazy? So the department that we were shooting at, the, the, the department that did all the Apollo archival stuff, they were really open. They helped us a lot. And then because of funding issues, they were closed maybe a year and a half ago, a year ago. And so because they were closed and that archive was closed, right now our production company in Toronto, which is basically me and my seven friends, are the largest holder of Apollo footage in the world. <laughs> our little office in Toronto. And for real, like we have more public footage than anywhere else in the world. And that office is unattended right now. No, 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 no. Matt Miller's there. Okay, I'm the okay, only right, person right. who's gone. Come on. You can't get... Well, even then, I mean, what, what are you going to do? It's like a 500-pound hard drive. Uh, I think there was a hand yep. There's a kind lot of in the middle there. They're so hard to see, just so yeah, you know, no. guys. Uh, red T-shirt near the back. Yep. Um, more uh, money on the film or the lawyer? Actually, we spent more money on music licenses than anything else by far. By far, the, the lawyer, uh, the lawyer uh, like paying legal fees was a lot, but uh, we paid way more in, in, in music licenses. This is a very cheap movie to make. Um, I mean, not, not by choice, <laughs> um, uh, but, but like, like The Dirties as well, which is about 90% music licenses in terms of budget, most of the money for this film went into music licenses as well. Uh, got a waving hand here. Are you a Capricorn One fan? Yeah, Capricorn One was a movie made in sort of the early 70s about uh, NASA faking a Mars landing. And yes, I mean, if you were a true Capricorn One fan, you would see that we stole seven or eight lines from that movie, some major lines, like, we are dead. Uh, this is, it, it's an awesome movie if you want to look at, like, sort of 70s B action thrillers. There's some of the best helicopter photography you'll ever see in your life. I'm not kidding. I don't even know how they shot some of this stuff. O.J. Simpson plays an astronaut. It's a great film, but, uh, but yeah, we were fans. I think the movie's a bit, a bit stupid. Like, their conspiracy makes no sense. A uh, duh. <laughs> you can't have a conspiracy where all of NASA knows about it. It's ridiculous. But, uh, but that's, that's uh, sort of a, a 70s era political thriller. Um, but yeah, we like that movie a lot. Our whole team, that was one of the touchstones for us. Y right there? Yeah, that's How do a great you deal question. With modern clothing when shooting at NASA. Yeah, so we did a few tricks. One of them was we had like spare. <laughs> this is going to again sound ridiculous that people agreed to this, but we brought extra suits and things with us. And sometimes when people were dressed in a way that we knew wouldn't work, we would ask them to just put these things on. So when when we're when we're interviewing Milt Heflin, who's a mission controller for like Apollo 12 or something like that, or no, I guess Apollo 14 we'd be like, hey, would you mind putting this on? And again, I guess it's just like Texan, like, all right, yeah, sure. They would just do it. And also, we digitally changed a lot of people's clothes. A lot. There's so much, so much digital work in this film that you would never know about. I mean, there's the obvious, really stupid stuff, like me, like Stanley Kubrick being there, or me being in shots that are clearly like that Forrest Gump effect. But just the amount that Tristan, we had one VFX artist on this film. One guy did absolutely everything on his own. Yo, it's crazy. If anybody knows anything about VFX, he did 275 shots or something for this movie um, on his own. And it, the, the amount of VFX that were just like going in, changing people's clothes, taking buildings out, taking out like cell phones, take, just taking out things that are just in a frame when we would try to shoot outside was massive. There's probably more of that work than there is like the stuff that you get to see and be like, wow, oh, isn't that cool? 
There's been one hand raised very high back there for a while. Well, I think, that, you know what, that, that may be, it's a lot easier than I think a lot of people would think, like just coming up with like the dialogue, because once you're, you sort of know what you're supposed to be doing, it, what you say, well, I guess that's just, we're, we're all friends, like what you say is not, it's not complicated to figure out. We had a very rigid structure of what the movie was going to do in terms of the breaks between Act 1, 2, and 3, and where we wanted the characters to move, mostly where we wanted Matt's mindset to be at every uh, point. But in, in terms of dialogue that we actually wrote, it was just the people who weren't close with us, where it, we couldn't like improvise. So like my boss, the CIA, his dialogue was mostly written. But even then, we would shoot things so many times that by the seventh or eighth take, we were encouraging people to just say whatever they wanted. And then we would just cut together the stuff that sem seemed the most credible. Because I think one of the big restrictions when you're making films at this budget is that you can't hire like actors who are you know s insanely experienced and are going to bring something really new and unique. This is not all all the time. You can discover people, but for this type of stuff, it's really really challenging to get genuine and strong performances from people uh, when they're dealing with a script. And so with the dirties, our way of sort of getting around that was being like, oh, why don't we just be in it ourselves, and we'll just shoot a ton and edit out all the moments that don't seem to work for us. Which is not to say that the acting in, in any of the things that we do is perfect, but it's functional, like it's, it's, it's functionally taking you from, from piece to piece. And, um, and that was almost like a creative problem solving tool for us. Um, so it also means you don't have to spend a lot of time writing, which is great. Instead you can spend, you know, 90, no, uh, no I won't tell you how long we edited this movie for, Never mind. <laughs> writing is the worst. Writing um, is the worst, yeah. The worst. Uh, so even beyond a script, how many preconceptions do you go into one of these projects with of like what you want it to look like at the end? Is it is it pretty free form or like you mentioned having the structure in place? Yeah. But I if you hadn't got that first NASA scene, for instance. It, everything would have changed. Exactly. But we're very open to that. Josh and I, who wrote, I wrote The Dirties with as well, we just sort of have an ideal version of where the character's going to wind up. Normally we know the ending. So in here we knew that the ending was going to be Matt watching these TVs at, at, uh, on the street, like outside of a Sears or something like that, and being like, oh, man, I wish my friend didn't have to die. Uh, and and it, with The Dirties, it was the same, that confrontation between Matt and Owen again in the school. But... It, as we shoot things and things sort of happen by accident, we'll always sort of move the, the plot around that. And also we really overwrite, like the first cut of this movie was probably three hours long. And even this version I still think is too long that there's stuff, where it, like it's so funny because it, the, it sort of lives as a, it, we shoot it like a fake documentary, but it really does sort of behave like a documentary. And as you shoot more, the story changes and things change, which is a crazy thing to think because we're controlling the story. But somehow it, it, it's still true. Even when with the comedy series that we shoot, it's the same, where the story will change without us meaning for it to. And uh, being open to that, I think, protects us from what happens to a lot of film students um, or, or early filmmakers, which is rigidly adhering to the idea that you thought was going to be perfect, even in the face of that idea not performing exactly the way you wanted it to. And, and certainly when you see a lot of this, like, like student work or early work, it almost seems like there's, it, it, it's like the, the film is resisting itself in some way. And, uh, and I'm not trying to say that this is a great way to solve that, but we, we don't. Like if, if we find footage or we find story points that are going to somewhere more interesting, we follow it and we just do that. Like when that guy Mike Gentry said, oh, there's these places on Earth that look like the moon and if you photograph them, they'll look good. We were like, oh yeah, that sounds really good. Let's use that and then let's go to all those places and shoot there. Like we never would have written that. Um, and it makes for very long shooting schedules and super painful, painful production. But for us, it's a lot of fun because we feel like we're doing something very challenging. I think we have time for one more question from the audience, so whoever wants it most, shout it out. Okay, yep, go yeah. for it. A uh, question about uh, using your own names and playing, your, playing versions of yourselves, perhaps. Yeah, that comes from uh, shooting in the real world. Uh, um, I'll give you an example. So when we went to NASA, I obviously called them and said, hi, my name's Matt Johnson. I'm coming there with 
my other, other film students, and we're going to shoot something. If I then, when we're shooting with them, was using a different name, I mean, this is pretty, this is almost obvious, but if I then was like, oh, yeah, and can you call me Mike while I'm here instead of Matt, it was just, just bizarre. They would be like, wait a minute, something's going on. And it's, it's a lot easier for us to use the moments that we don't plan or where things happen by mistake if we're using our real names because maybe Owen, you know, stubs his toe and goes, oh, fuck, Matt, I stubbed my toe. And that's a stupid example, but maybe there's something really awesome in that moment where he stubbed his toe and uses my real name. And so to have our names all be the same just means that it's like you don't know when we're shooting, you don't know when we're not shooting. Like I don't even know like when I'm on camera and when I'm having a conversation if it's real or it's not real. And, and that may sound crazy <laughs> and not great for my mental health, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's really excellent in terms of uh, using, using everything you can get. Because when, you're, when you have nothing to work with, like nothing, you don't want anything to go to waste at all. Like if something awesome happens on camera and you can't use it because somebody forgot your character name, like I would kill myself. <laughs> like that's, that's, that's so crazy to let something go because of something so stupid. And it, it's, there's something interesting. I, I, I think at some level I also like the weirdness of being like, the same in the movies as I am in real life and having that be a challenge for the people who know me, you know? <laughs> I'd be like, well, are you going to kill me or, you know? With the dirties, it was more interesting. I'll say, I'll say that. All right, well, thank you, Matt, so much for coming back. Thank you film. so much. I love screening movies here. This is a great city. Thank you, guys. All right, guys, thanks for coming out. Stick around for Under the Shadow if you have nowhere better to be. Oh, yeah, this next movie is very good. It really is. Yeah, 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 uh, it's quite scary. <laughs>